Well, this isn't good. Ground tests for Starship S-37 are done, but unusual activity at Pad 1 suggests possible issues. Could another test be coming, and will it delay the launch? Meanwhile, new concerns are emerging about moon based plans due to moon quakes. But there's also good news ahead, including updates on Starship's Florida expansion and the Europa Clipper mission. Currently, S 37 has been moved back into Mega Bay 2, which usually signals that major testing has concluded. In parallel, the OLM, or Orbital Launch Mount Test System, that was used during the S 37 static fires is being dismantled. The test stand itself is now being relocated to the Sanchez site, where it'll be kept in storage for potential future use as a backup system. What's more surprising, however, is that new systems are not the only ones being moved. Some unusual activity has recently been spotted at Pad 1. Most notably, 15 out of the 20 booster hold-down clamps have been removed from the OLM. These clamp arms are critical components designed to secure the Super Heavy booster during pre-launch operations. According to standard procedure, after a ship test is completed, the pad is usually refurbished in preparation for the next mission. In this case, that would involve bringing B-16 to the the pad for integration. However, with the removal of most of the clamp arms, B-16 cannot be placed on the launch mount unless those systems are restored or replaced. That suggests a disruption in the expected flow of operations, and it raises a critical question. Why would SpaceX remove such essential hardware at this particular stage? The most widely discussed theory is that SpaceX intends to conduct another round of testing with S-37. While the recent static fire tests appeared successful to the naked eye, there is speculation that the data collected may not have met internal performance benchmarks. Observers have pointed out that the six-engine static fire test lasted just over 10 seconds, which is much shorter than the one-minute tests performed on more recent prototypes. This shorter duration suggests that SpaceX may have been aiming to verify specific performance parameters, without pushing the engines to full operational limits. If this theory is true, true, SpaceX might be planning a more extensive test to explore engine flexibility and endurance in preparation for Flight 10. However, this idea is complicated by the fact that SpaceX has already removed the test systems and moved the stand to storage. In order to retest S-37, they'd need to reinstall the testing infrastructure, transfer the vehicle back onto the stand, and repeat the procedures. That process would take a considerable amount of time and effort. If SpaceX does pursue this option, it would likely delay Flight 10. The timeline would have to account for rebuilding the test platform, moving and reintegrating S-37, conducting the test, and then returning it to Mega Bay 2 for final checkouts and installation. This entire sequence could take one to two weeks, given that the projected timeline for Flight 10 had originally targeted mid-August. Such a delay would almost certainly push the launch window further out. However, if an additional test increases the reliability of the vehicle and improves mission success, it might be a a worthwhile trade-off. In the latest update, SpaceX truly moved the test stand back to the launch site. Some vacuum engines were moved to Mega Bay 2, so S-37 may be tested again with new engines, and they can increase the test limit at the upcoming test. A second and perhaps more grounded theory is that the hold-down clamps themselves are undergoing maintenance. In this case, SpaceX may have identified a mechanical issue or wear and tear that requires the clamps to be removed for inspection, repair, or replacement. This explanation is supported by the visible readiness of B-16, which appears to have completed its installation process and is prepared for rollout. If the clamp removal is purely for maintenance, they can be reinstalled once repairs are complete, allowing operations to resume without a significant schedule impact. Under this scenario, the launch schedule for Flight 10 could still remain intact, especially if the work is completed within a short time frame. However, this would place greater reliance on S-37's performance during its relatively short static fire test. While previous Starship prototypes have launched following similar short duration tests, the standard in recent months have shifted towards longer full duration engine burns, especially now that the flame trench is operational and capable of handling the stress of longer firings.
So what do you think is going to happen? Will SpaceX test S-37 again before Flight 10? Let me know with a yes or a no in the comment section down below. Then be sure to like the video and subscribe to our channel to stay up to date on every milestone in SpaceX's incredible development journey. While we are on the topic of Starship, let us shift our attention to Florida. The expansion of Starship operations to the East Coast has been in discussion for several years, and now we are seeing real progress on that front. SpaceX has active plans for two key locations, Launch Complex 39A or LC-39A, and Space Launch Complex 37 or SLC-37. At LC-39A, construction is already well underway. A new Starship launch tower has been built at the site, and the orbital launch mount is currently undergoing renovations. These developments show that SpaceX is preparing the site for future Starship missions in earnest. In terms of planning, a major milestone was achieved last year when the environmental impact statement for Starship launches from LC-39A was released. That report outlined a target of up to 44 Starship launches per year from this historic pad. Recently, the effort has taken another step forward. The FAA has officially announced the release of the draft environmental assessment for Starship activities at LC-39A. The new document maintains the same annual launch target, but provides greater detail regarding infrastructure and operational areas. Notably, it introduces more specific names for new systems and designated zones within the launch complex. It also outlines access restriction areas that will be, re be enforced during testing, launching, and landing activities. This transition from environmental impact statement to an environmental assessment shows that specific work is now in motion. Regulatory agencies will begin conducting actual surveys and assessments on site. The process includes a public review phase, which will remain open for comments until the 29th of September of this year. The FAA has also scheduled public meetings for late August and early September to gather further input. Once the comment period ends and any revisions are made, the FAA will publish the final environmental assessment. This final document will give the green light for construction and launch operations to proceed at LC-39A. Once that approval is secured and Starship's operational capabilities at the site are confirmed, full-scale facility work and launch preparations can begin. A promising future lies ahead for Starship in Florida. If all goes smoothly, we may soon witness Starship launches from the legendary Kennedy Space Center, a site long known as the Mecca of Aerospace Innovation. Next, we turn our attention to a topic that may prove highly relevant to the future of SpaceX's Starship program, growing concerns surrounding the construction of a moon base. On the 30th of July, a study published in the journal Science Advances revealed seismic risk that may threaten future infrastructure on the moon. Geophysicists examined the Apollo 17 landing site in the torres Littrow Valley, where astronauts last walked on the moon in 1972. Their goal was to assess how seismic activity, particularly moonquakes triggered by underground fault lines, has shaped the region over time. The study's findings suggest that ancient moonquakes have shaken the area repeatedly over tens of millions of years and that some of the fault lines may still be active today. This introduces a significant challenge for any mission that involves constructing permanent structures on the moon's surface. The authors warn that building too close to active faults could present serious hazards, although the statistical chance of a damage moonquake near an active fault occurring on any given day is just 1 in 20 million, the researchers urge caution when interpreting that number. Nicholas Schmer, a geophysicist at the University of Maryland and co-author of the study, offered an important perspective. In a statement, he said, if astronauts are there for a day, they would just have very bad luck if there was a damaging event. It's similar to going from the extremely low odds of winning a lottery to much higher odds of being dealt a four-of-a-kind poker hand. While the odds of a major event in a single day may be low, they rise substantially over time. If humans were to stay on the moon for a continuous 10-year period, as future Artemis missions intend, the risk of experiencing a damaging earthquake increases to approximately 1 in 5,500. That compounded risk could be especially relevant for the Starship Human Landing System, or Starship HLS. Unlike the relatively lightweight Apollo landers, Starship HLS will be significantly larger and heavier. That added mass and potential surface impact could make future infrastructure more vulnerable to moonquakes than past missions. In this context, proper site selection becomes not just a logistical concern, but a critical safety factor. Schmer emphasized this point by stating, We want to make sure that our exploration of the moon is done safely and that investments are made in a way that is carefully thought out. The conclusion we came to is do not build right on top of a scarp or recently active fault. 
The farther away from a scarp, the lesser the hazard. One major challenge in building a moon base is the lack of a seismic monitoring network. Unlike Earth, the moon has no sensors to track tectonic activity. To estimate seismic risks, researchers analyzed visual signs like sliding boulders and landslides, modeling a hypothetical magnitude 3.0 moonquake along the Lee-Lincoln Fault near the Apollo 17 site. Their findings suggest such a quake could dislodge boulders and trigger local landslides, events far more damaging on the moon due to its unstable surface. These faults are common and likely formed through repeated small slips, increasing the risk across potential landing zones. While seismic effects weaken with distance, this research highlights the need for detailed geological assessments before building permanent structures. Agencies like NASA and SpaceX must factor these risks into their planning. In short, building a moon base is difficult but necessary. With smart planning, sound engineering, and careful site selection, a safe and sustainable lunar presence is within reach. Now, let's move beyond the moon and turn our attention to another exciting deep space mission, Europa Clipper. NASA's Europa Clipper has cleared a major milestone. During a planned Mars flyby, it successfully tested its ice-penetrating radar, REASON, or Radar for Europa Assessment and Sounding, Ocean to Near Surface. The test validated its ability to detect subsurface water, a key goal in the search for life beyond Earth. Reason performed flawlessly, bouncing radar signals off Mars's volcanic plains and returning 60 gigabytes of data over 40 minutes. NASA confirmed the system worked exactly as intended, proving its readiness for Europa's harsh environment. Europa Clipper is set to arrive at Jupiter in 2030. It'll conduct 40 flybys of Europa, mapping its surface and probing for hidden oceans. As one of the most promising missions in deep space, it brings us closer to discovering whether life could exist beneath Europa's icy shell. With this successful test behind it, Europa Clipper is on track, and all eyes now turn to Jupiter. Ship 37's full duration static fire is done. Flight 10 can't be far behind. Crew 11 launched successfully, though new issues have surfaced post-flight. And the U.S. Space Force is prepping its next X-37B space plane mission. After the rapid return to static fire testing and the success of Ship 37's single-engine trial, SpaceX prepared for its most significant ground milestone in months the full-duration six-engine static fire. Though the closure of local roads for this event, scheduled quietly from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. on August 1st, wasn't widely publicized, it underscored just how critical this test would be. Early that morning, the familiar choreography unfolded. The Raptor work platform descended into place around Ship 37, then rolled back to clear the way. Support crews activated the detonation suppression system, and inspectors sealed off safety perimeters. By mid-morning, the giant chopstick cranes lifted into position, ready to hold ship steady once the burn concluded. At roughly 2 p.m., the first clouds of vapor drifted from the tank farm. Liquid oxygen and methane flowed through freshly inspected lines on the orbital launch mount into Ship 37's tanks. Though a few utility vehicles made last-minute trips past the pad, reflecting minor troubleshooting, the fueling sequence proceeded without hiccup. Steel frost rings delineated the liquid oxygen fill level, while methane telltale frosting crept across the lower tank surfaces. The live stream cameras even caught another flap exercise, reminding viewers that attitude control surfaces would play their part during ascent. With fueling complete, the site fell silent for a tense minute. Then water gushed from the massive deluge nozzles beneath the pad. Within heartbeats, six Raptor engines roared to life each one thrusting against the dampened flame trench and sending shockwaves through the desert air. A plume of smoke and dust billowed outward, momentarily obscuring the booster before clearing to reveal a steady, simultaneous shutdown after roughly 10 seconds. SpaceX later confirmed on X, full duration static fire for the Starship preparing for our 10th flight test. It was a succinct victory lap. Ship 37's engines and plumbing had performed flawlessly. The new test stand and water deluge system had withstood the harsh thermal and acoustic stresses. And most importantly, the groundwork was set for Flight 10 itself. In the hours that followed, the post-test routine began. Chopsticks lowered Ship 37 gently onto its transport stand, then the crane released. Ground crews fastened inspection plates over each engine's throat and exhaust, preparing the vehicle for its slow trek back to Mega Bay 2. Over the coming hours, S-37 would be stowed beneath the bay's roof. 
where technicians would pour over telemetry, sample engine components, and ready the ship for its next transformation. The installation of avionics, payload fixtures, and final heat shield touches. Meanwhile, across the yard, activity at Megabay 2 continued apace. Early that morning, after S-37's cryo test, Ship 38 had been rolled inside for its own series of checks. With engines soon to be installed and flaps already in place, S-38 is poised to follow its sister vessel through cryogenic proof, static fires, and ultimately, a full launch cycle. If all goes according to plan, Flight 11 could arrive barely a month behind Flight 10. SpaceX and NASA faced one last hurdle before Crew 11 could depart on schedule, the Florida skies. Despite a 90% favorable forecast, Thick cumulus clouds rolled over Launch Complex 39A just as the countdown neared zero, forcing a rare scrub of the July 31st launch. Crew members, suited and ready, were escorted back to the operations and checkout 